Part One. Okay, I'd like to welcome you to another edition of the Russian Orthodox Medievalists.、Uh, I want to thank all of my regular listeners.、Um, I've heard that I've gotten some good comments. I normally don't check. Uh, blogs and things like that,、uh, but but I appreciate、um, uh, legitimate criticism and and、um, of course、uh, affirmation of of what we do here, and what we do do here primarily is to deepen our knowledge of、uh, Russia and its culture and history and religion, with the vision and with the understanding that the Russian-led alliance, which now includes、uh, Armenia.、Um, China,、um, Iran, and、uh, Kazakhstan.、Uh, this this alliance is aimed at the new world order. That Russia is one of its primary players, and Russia is now leading、uh, this counter alliance to the American Israeli、uh, war machine. And and that's you know I mean there's ideological differences, there are political differences, there are religious differences. Um, but suffice it to say that the Russian counter alliance is largely one based on nationalism, one based on regionalism,、uh, one based on a strong state for the sake of self-defense. While on the other hand, the American-led、uh, alliance is based on liberalism, is based on buccaneer capitalism, and quite frankly, is based on oligarchy. Uh, and this is why, I mean, at the most basic level, this is why、uh, the American ruling class, both neoconservative and neoliberal, openly supported the Russian oligarchs against Vladimir Putin.、And、the fact is that whether it be Ariel Cohen at the Heritage Foundation or John McCain or Bill Clinton or any of these other people, regardless of their background, the American、uh, dominant oligarchical interests、uh, saw. Uh, a kindred spirit in Russia itself, and they came to the defense of oligarchy. They came to the defense of the domination、uh, of of labor of the Russian people, the Ukrainian people, in the hands of a handful of oligarchs,、uh, the vast majority of whom were also citizens of Israel.、Uh, and so, the American ruling class, and we, you know, this is purely foundational here, but we need to know that the American ruling class. In the Russian case, openly came out for an oligarchical constitution.、Uh, they did it strictly in a, in a Russian context.、Uh, they may not have the、um, uh, safety, the the confidence to say it in an American context. But in the Russian context, both neoconservatives and neoliberals came out with the concept that the oligarchy should rule; it has a right to rule. And this is, believe it or not, I mean, this is what the American ruling class. Openly calls democracy. So certainly, if that's the definition of democracy, then I and this show are extremely anti-democratic. We are nationalists. We believe in ethnicity. We believe in tradition. We believe in the life of the land. We believe in a life of simplicity and religious devotion.、Uh, and and these things don't fall from the sky. These cultural things. And I've been saying this and writing this for、uh, almost twenty years now. That these structures, the ethnic tradition, national tradition, these structures derive from suffering. They derive from the growth and development of the nation itself, long before there was ever any kind of centralized state to to dominate them. And that's what ethnicity really is. They are structures of survival. The structures of survival. These are the methods. These are the ideas. Lived by the common people that brought the common people out of suffering. This is why they're they're valuable,、uh, you know. And 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 this is why, as far as the Western、uh, American ruling class is concerned, these cultural buttresses have to be destroyed because these cultural buttresses are the primary uh, uh, rationale and background for revolt. It is not abstract ideology. Uh, the leftist、uh, Marxist and anarchist views; these are pseudo radical. They are largely supported by the ruling classes,、um, and and grant money is often given to their to their scholars and and writers.、Uh, that's pseudo rebellion. The the real rebellion is the ethnic、uh, local tradition. 
an ethnic local tradition which itself is the product of suffering. It's the product of what the people have gone through. And these structures are the means whereby the people have gotten through uh, this kind of suffering. And that's why the ethnic principle is so important. It's a moral principle. It is a moral idea. So in this show, we deal primarily with these structures as they concern Russia and Ukraine, and specifically the Orthodox Church, which is the moral and spiritual bond between them. And given that, uh, today we are going to deal a little bit with literature. And today we are going to deal... Um, some general concepts and some more specific ideas in the thought of Fyodor Dostoevsky. Um, Dostoevsky is somebody uh, not greatly understood in the West, largely because in order to read Dostoevsky or or a Gogol or or Chekhov or any of these people, you have to have a solid grounding in not only Russian history, in the history of the Slavic peoples but you also have to have a good working knowledge of the orthodox life and orthodox theology. Normally, uh, university professors in literature who are incompetent on so many levels, uh, even when they want to focus on Russian stuff, they often don't have the background in Russian history, Russian uh, ideological movements, social movements, political movements, not to mention the theology and the development of the orthodox idea as it's developed over the last thousand years uh, in order to properly evaluate and understand very com- uh, complex writers like Gogol or Dostoevsky. Now, um, I happen to prefer Gogol to, to Dostoevsky, uh, but there's no doubt that the two of them uh, put Russia on the map as far as literature is concerned. Of course, Pushkin is, is another one. Uh, but today we're going to deal with uh, Dostoevsky and really some of the more basic approaches that you can take in reading his material. We're going to deal with some general ideas first, and then if we have time, we're going to get into uh, a few a few issues uh, in um, uh, The House of the Dead and my favorite a novel from Dostoevsky, uh, The Idiot which is only rarely read uh, in the West anymore, and that's a terrible shame. Let's say this. Let's start off by saying that Dostoevsky's primary, uh, primary reason for writing, his whole focus, is that there are two forces fighting for control and the devotion of the human heart and the human mind that exists in politics, it exists in morality, it exists in theology, but it also exists in psychology. It exists within every person. And that is the devotion to the Son of God, on the one hand, the idea that through struggle and through self-limitation, through the ascetic life, one can reach divine status, man becoming God. And man becomes God only because God himself has become man. The other side is exactly the opposite. The other side is the rule of Prometheus or Lucifer, essentially one and the same being. The being that promises that through some purely material mechanism, either through ideology or through scientific technique or through something like this, man through his own power can become God. So it's the deification of individuals based on two very different principles. Those two different principles are the basis of the schism, the schism not just in Russian life, which is you know Dostoevsky's whole thing from a regional point of view, but also in every human soul, no matter when they lived or where they lived. The struggle between uh, man seeking to extend and expand himself to dominate nature and as such to become God or, on the other hand, the simple ascetic approach, the concept of self-limitation to allow God to fill the believer and to bring him to divine status that way. The whole concept of man becoming divine through the influx of God, this is the central concept of orthodoxy. Wherever you find it, in Greece, in Russia, in Ukraine, this is the idea, and it's very different from the Western confessions. Uh, for this reason, it's a process 
of experiencing the transfiguration through the energies of the Holy Spirit from uh, or to each believer. It's not this series of legalistic rules that you find, for example, in uh, most Counter-Reformation Roman Catholicism. So, even that very basic distinction is often lost on commentators on Dostoevsky, and they don't realize that this is really the nature of this schism that Dostoevsky is dealing with, and goes through everything that the man uh, has ever written. Now, Prometheus Lucifer, you know, I'm deliberately not using the word Satan here. Uh, Satan is a title. Um, Antichrist is a title. Uh, in, in Dostoevsky's corpus, and really in the Orthodox mind, Prometheus slash Lucifer, this is a sort of mentality. This is the mentality of the Freemasonic Lodges, this is the mentality of uh, Frederick Nietzsche. This is this is the idea that the Promethean uh, idea is that, particularly the way Dostoevsky uses it, you see this in Gogol as well, uh, the idea is that once an objective truth and falsehood, i.e. those things that exist outside of the human person as true, rather than being created by people that exist outside of people and are discovered, if that objective understanding of truth and falsehood is eliminated, then all that remains is power. That's why uh, Nietzsche is, in his own way, absolutely correct. Nietzsche and the existentialists who he helped form, um, and Nietzsche, by the way, because of Dostoevsky's particular interest in this, Nietzsche says that the only man that ever taught me anything about psychology was Dostoevsky. And it's odd because Dostoevsky vehemently opposed this whole concept of the will to power that Nietzsche was to make very famous. But Nietzsche and Dostoevsky were both honest enough to realize that when objectivity is eliminated, when absolute standards are eliminated, the only thing that remains is power. Dostoevsky holds that atheism is not scientific, it is a metaphysical approach to the world that the Promethean mentality, the Luciferian mentality, so central at least to the upper degrees of Freemasonry, needs the Trinity, needs God to fight. That the Luciferian mentality only functions if God exists. And then the Luciferian mentality then uh, uh, drapes itself as negation. And it's not an accident that this comes up in Dostoevsky's The Possessed, where the entire nihilistic movement doesn't exist in that they believe in nothing. That's not what nihilism means. Nihilism means that everything that exists, and of course we're talking about Russia, 1860s, 1870s, needs to be destroyed so that the will to power can come and dominate. Now, they never exactly say what it is they're going to build. They normally do approach the world as a matter of negation, but both in Nietzsche's case and the nihilists that came after him uh, the fact is that the will to power was primarily negation, but it was negation with the understanding that something else is going to be uh, built. Now, there are people, in, uh, characters in Dostoevsky's novels, again, I'm thinking of Stavrogin in uh, The Possessed, where God cannot be known. And one of the ways that this is the case is that the structure of their mind is exists in such a way that um, the concept of this kind of external reality, not necessarily just God as, as, as the absolute, but also anything that can be picked up by the senses, is in fact non-existent. That means all external stimuli can be reduced to inner psychic states. And Dostoevsky, you know, I mean, there's this problem where someone is asked to give a proof of God's existence, and then the retort is, I'll prove the existence of God if you prove the existence of matter. And, of course, matter cannot be proven. Nothing in observation can be proven. All we know is that our senses um, uh, provide not a report of external reality, but simply tell us about our current psychic state. The fact that we have a psychic state, we know at any given moment. But that this psychic state is occasioned 
by the existence of exter- external objects. That is another matter. From a logical point of view, it cannot be proven. It has to be taken on faith. But that's a problem in and of itself. You see, ultimately, in Dostoevsky's corpus, and I'm thinking particularly here of the possessed as well as crime and punishment, the idea is that not only um, is, is power your result if you remove objective standards, but more than this, if you remove objective standards and then reduce what we think are our senses, our sense data, to psychic states, then the absolute content of life is eliminated. What the individual will faces is the void. Ultimately, this is uh, the problem that runs through all of Dostoevsky's corpus. It is very rare to find somebody who can confront the void. Nietzsche is one of these people. Nietzsche was able to say that the structure of reality is non-existent. Reality is something that is imposed on the herd by the dominant will. This is central to Nietzsche. It comes up in most of the um, corpus of Dostoevsky and has to be taken very seriously. But Nietzsche knew that only a handful of people had that capability. Dostoevsky knows that only a handful of people have that capability or are even able to ask the question about the void, never mind actually coming up with an answer to it. The average human being, Dostoevsky says, cannot rest with the understanding that his life is meaningless. They are not satisfied, intellectually or any other way, with the idea that his life is meaningless. He is born for no purpose, he lives and suffers for no purpose, he dies for no purpose, and goes back into the void. That, that is not a... Uh, from Dostoevsky's view, Gogol's view, most of Russian literature, in fact, in, in the 19th century, that is not an acceptable uh, understanding. So the average person then seeks to find salvation in something else. Um, usually, and, and, in, and particularly in, in The Possessed, you see it to some extent in The Brothers Ketamasov, you see it a few other places, that ideology, political ideology, scientific theories, uh, these come to fill the void. But even there, these are very unstable. And the real subtext of the possessed is this idea that ideology is never a substitute for reality. Ideology is never a substitute for a true purpose in life, a purpose that existed prior to your birth, during your birth, and will continue to exist after your birth. Because even if I was to put my faith in scientific technique, or in political ideology, or some moral theory, or some hard and fast ideological doctrine, I realize that, number one, these things are created by men, uh, and number two, because of that, these things are always changing. New paradigms are coming in, old paradigms are going out, and it's impossible to tell what exists uh, uh, from personal self-interest, what exists from the powerful, and what is really true. So even these ways of trying to deal with with the meaningless meaninglessness of existence, these things are never satisfying. And this is why uh, early on Dostoevsky is called, along with Nietzsche, as one of your first existentialists. In other words, views that people hold are not held by them because they have uh, logically deduced them from absolute principles. Uh, views are not held by people because this is what is absolutely true. Uh, views are held by people uh, instrumentally. They're held by people because um, it helps them deal with life. They have a particular self-interest is being served by holding these views. It's very rarely, if ever, uh, a rational approach to reality, whatever that happens to be. Uh, there is no absolute axiomatic principle that we can deduce something from. It simply doesn't exist. Dostoevsky is particularly sensitive to that point. Therefore, he's going to hold basically that these views, scientific, ideological, moral, whatever, these views are essentially arbitrary. That these views derive are, are held by people on the basis of self-interest, or it makes them sound smart, or it makes them sound sophisticated, or uh, this is how they were brought up, or this is what makes them feel good. And you notice that if that's the case, then p- 
people really are wicked and people really are fraudulent all the way down as deep as it can go because you know they're 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 basing their views purely on something that allows them to deal with life and more specifically allows them to deal with uh, the void that all human beings face this is central to Nietzsche, Dostoevsky. Existentialism is a matter of course. So, uh, uh, Dostoevsky will hold up to his readers this concept that you either pick that which is unchanging, whether it be God or the forms of Plato. And of course, you know, many, many Orthodox people are heavily influenced by Plato. I'm very much a Platonist. Uh, I think Plato is, is and, and, and Plotinus and the Neoplatonic movement in that era uh, is, is a very satisfying approach. Uh, but you either have this objective reality that exists in a transcendent form, it exists outside of our moods or our interests or the society that we live in, or we approach the void. Now, uh, uh, Dostoevsky also holds up somebody like uh, the father who was eventually murdered in uh, the brothers Ketamasov, this kind of debauched, um, you know, a sexual addict, an alcoholic, uh, whatever, as uh, really another way of dealing with the fact that all human beings have to make that choice. Ideology, alcohol, medication, we would say today, all of this stuff uh, is a way of, um, a very weak way, as it turns out, of dealing with the choice that, the way Dostoevsky puts it, it is either God or it is the void. The fact is that Dostoevsky is convinced that most people solve the problem by never asking the question and condemning anyone who actually does ask the question. And this is nothing unique to Dostoevsky. This is a huge part of the Western philosophical heritage. Socrates asked this question. Uh, St. Augustine asked this question. The great theologians of the patristic period asked this question. And something that Socrates realized, and you see it from the apology straight up to the end of his career, that if you deny the existence of transcendent absolute reality, the only thing that you are left with is eternal flux, the void, and the will to power. That means that whoever has power, who's able, uh, ever capable of, of reaching to power, who is uh, capable of dominating you, has the right to do it. And they have the right to do it because there is no place for you to stand. If you deny transcendent new reality, you deny the ability to transcend space and time and criticize societies and peoples and their actions from that point of view. Without God, without the absolute, you have the flux, you have the void ultimately that void is filled uh, with power it is filled with whoever it is that's powerful enough to dominate society to uh, control ideology, what people believe, what shows up in the media what is considered mainstream and what is expelled to the outer darkness of extremity uh, and that's all, you, that, that's all that remains science always changes ideology always changes Fashion always changes. And so people deal with that through irrational behavior. This is something that comes up over and over again in Dostoevsky's corpus. One of the great examples of this approach, the approach of the choice that people make, we could find in somebody who's been dealt with a lot, of course, um, Raskolnikov in Crime and Punishment. Um, Raskolnikov is somebody who approaches this question of the void by adopting the Nietzschean point of view. He reasons this way. Now, he's going to turn out to be a, a killer, and that's really at the very beginning of the novel and, and makes sense of the story as a whole. Here's the deal. As far as crime and punishment goes, we could simplify it this way. Raskolnikov uh, 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 approaches the void. He realizes that there's a void there. He's got to fill it somehow. Clearly, he is a Nietzschean of one kind or another. He says to himself, I read in my history books that some of the great heroes of our civilization have been responsible for the death of thousands, if not millions, of people. 
I read about all the great monarchs of Russian history. I read about Napoleon. I read about the American revolutionaries. I read about the British Civil War. And you have heroes and villains. And the heroes, as it turns out, under all kinds of circumstances, even in the Old Testament of the Bible, have killed large numbers of people. Sometimes, lots and lots of innocent people. So I tell you what I'm going to do. I am going to kill a woman who I know, an old lady that everybody hates, who takes advantage of the poor. She's a pawnbroker. She takes advantage of poor people. She's a usurer. She charges a lot of interest on her money. Everyone hates her. So if my understanding of history is consistent, when I kill her, I'm in fact not only committing a moral act, but I should be a hero. If Napoleon is someone to admire, who is responsible for killing God knows how many innocent people, not to mention combatants, then how much more wonderful am I going to be if I kill one miserable, disgusting pawnbroker? And you figure, well, you know, at, at first glance, when I lectured on this at the university, students really didn't know what to say to this. Uh, those who were actually paying attention uh, began to squirm a little bit. How do you answer that? How do you answer this? That... You know, we're eliminating somebody who, by any moral standard, is a disgusting human being. Well, this is exactly what he does. He axes her to death. Now, unfortunately for him, uh, a young woman walks in, uh, witnesses this crime, and so he's got to eliminate her, too. But, you know, this is it's, it's something that I had to do with. You know, i got to get away with this. Everyone lives with this slave morality. What am I going to do? But from that moment on, something happens. But Askolnikov is slowly going to go insane. And there's a, a whole lot of detail here which we're not going to deal with. But suffice it to say that this crime that he commits is sort of the Nietzschean approach to the fact that, at least in his mind, the only thing that exists is the void, the eternal flux of matter, which really is one and the same thing. And if that's true then the only thing that exists is power. Now, here's the deal. The name of this character is Raskolnikov. Raskol in Russia means schism. It means a split. The axe in Russian history, that he, what he uses to kill the old pawnbroker, the axe is an old symbol of um, double-mindedness, of um, a living a lie. Uh, it, it cuts both ways. It, it's very useful for civilization, but it's also very destructive. And in fact, all elements of civilization, to the extent that they derive from power relations, are as evil as they are good. And ultimately, uh, throughout Dostoevsky's corpus, it is the simplicity. The hero, the heroine in, in um, uh, Sonia, in, in um, Crime and Punishment, uh, Prince Mishkin in The Idiot, uh, these are never learned people. These people somehow either exist outside of civilization in one sense or another, or exist apart from civilization to one extent or another. Dostoevsky will always have a very ambiguous approach to the institutions of civilization. Not just modern civilization, but civilization in general. Because every institution that has come to build up civilization of whatever type is useful and that it produces certain things that we can use or that we want. But it's also the result of power. It always privileges some people over others. It's an attempt to control nature. It is something in the Russian mind that, when you read Pushkin's uh, The Bronze Horseman, for example, it's something that goes back to Peter the Great, the man who sought to build the greatest city in Europe on the most inhospitable swamps of northwestern Russia. And it was a Masonic experiment. It was a Masonic experiment in that civilization can dominate, control, and manipulate matter in the interests of the initiated. Uh, Peter was initiated. Uh, he was a Freemason. He, he was initiated in Amsterdam. Uh, into a into a lodge on his uh, grand embassy, and that's related uh, in um, Robert Massey's book, uh, the very humongous uh, biography of Peter the Great. It's actually a mainstream work you can get anywhere. 
uh, where it, it does hold that the the Petersburg idea is an experiment. It is a explicit Promethean approach to nature. This is not lost on Dostoevsky. The axe that Raskolnikov is going to use to kill is the axe of the Petrine state. It is the way that you know trees can be felled to, to begin building homes and, and civilization in general, but that axe can also kill you. We might, we might look at civilization, we might look at all the benefits that we gain from it, but oftentimes we don't notice that the, um, the, the artifacts of civilization uh, have been responsible for the deaths of hundreds of millions of people, uh, whether it be you know, in weaponry, in wars over territory or money, uh, wars over greed, wars over pride, all of these deriving from the institutions of advanced civilization. Uh, there is always, civilization itself is a double-edged sword. It's an axe. It's an axe with two blades, one behind and one before. This is essential to understanding Dostoevsky, specifically crime and punishment, but it comes up again and again and again. It has a whole lot of different uh, metaphors that are used, but it's something essential uh, to Dostoevsky's approach to the world. Uh, you see it again in a character that has a lot written on him, some of it worthwhile, a lot of it uh, is in my uh, cat's litter box right about now. Uh, Ivan Karamazov and the brothers Karamazov, you see a very similar thing. In both cases, you have a person split in two. In Crime and Punishment, Raskolnikov will eventually turn himself in and deliberately go to Siberia. He's doing this because, I mean, he could have gotten away with it. He eventually couldn't. There, there, was, there was another side to him, a side to him that was in contact with the transcendent. He had been suppressing it. It's a split, not just in Russian civilization, in civilization, but in every person. What will drive him crazy is that he can't keep up the act forever. He realizes that he has transgressed something that no man, including Napoleon, has a right to transgress. That side of him, not that exists in imperial, uh, in, in, in uh, empirical nature, but the side of him that exists in the transcendent world began to torment him and to drive him crazy. This is more than conscience. This is way more than, we're not talking about conscience here. We're talking about a completely different element in the human person. We're talking about the soul in the Christian sense as well as in Plato's sense. This entity of the human person that alone can have some contact with the absolute truth of the world that exists and can only exist in transcendence. You see it in Raskolnikov. This is why he will eventually turn himself in. He will turn himself in because he knows that he deserves punishment, that there are objective laws that exist outside of space and time. In other words, it doesn't matter whether or not a government accepts it or not. It doesn't matter whether or not you're caught. You know you are guilty in both. In, you see this in Plato, and you see it in um, Dostoevsky. The concept in the specific work of Plato is the Gorgias, which is definitely worth your time. Uh, punishment is a very good thing. Plato argues that it's better for a criminal to be caught and punished than for the criminal, uh, even if he never commits another crime again, to get away with it. Because the punishment will restore the balance to the person, speaking very simply. It will restore the balance of the person. Punishment is a good thing because it is restorative. It restores that balance. The balance between the empirical world that we live in, like it or not, and that world that we often shut out, that world of transcendent reality. That is to say, that reality outside of space and time. This is very common. This is a, this is a, a common concept in Western philosophy. And Dostoevsky uh, believes that these experiences can't really be put in the expository prose of the philosopher. It has to be stated in really sort of the day-to-day -day empirical approach to the world that you find in literature. Here is the same schism, the same split in Ivan Karamazov, one of the Karamazov brothers uh, uh, made famous by the book. Now, here's a man who is struggling with this very same schism, but it's stated here a little differently. On the one hand, you have the concept 
that if God does not exist, or putting it differently, if transcendent reality does not exist, then all things are possible. If God does exist, if transcendent reality does exist, then I must accept the reality of innocent suffering. And this comes up quite often. Ivan is tortured by this schism. Innocent suffering is an issue when transcendent reality exists because this transcendent reality is by its very definition changeless and therefore perfect. If X is true, then X must never change. Absolutely central to Plato, to St. Augustine, to Christianity, to Dostoevsky. You see it in that very, very straight line. Now, you know, the, the, these two schisms, in Ivan's case, uh, it's, it's highly problematic. At the very least, Raskolnikov will um, uh, turn himself in and go off to Siberia, and he's happy to go off to Siberia because there he will be able to pay the price. In both cases, crime and punishment and the brothers Ketamasov, those two characters are tortured by this very same schism. It's put differently that you know there exists a realm of perfection and a will that is God who in a personality who is in control of it and if that's the case in Raskolnikov's case if that's true then I must turn myself in because I am objectively guilty if I am objectively guilty then I must be punished whether I want to be or not Plato would say that the truly moral man wants to be punished for the restoration of balance, the restoration of the natural law. On the other hand, um, Ivan Karamazov puts it in, in a way that if, if, if God does not exist, I could do whatever I please. But I don't want to believe that God exists, because if that's true, then I need to suffer with the fact that God has permitted the existence of innocent suffering. It's really the same concept just uh, in two, uh, putting it in, in, two, in two, different, two different ways. This battle really typifies the character of Ivan Ketamasov, and what it comes down to is the following. No man, under any circumstances, can violate absolute value. If he does this, he will be tortured as a result of it, regardless of how it all turns out, whether it be suicide, whether it be... Uh, fanatical ideology, or whether it be conversion, uh, or whatever it is, when absolute value, when that line is transgressed, the result is pain, agony, and and uh, and torture. Dostoevsky's corpus is based around the idea that without a superior idea to self-interest in life, life is a mockery, life is a joke, and is not worth um, living when there's no purpose in it. That Dostoevsky holds throughout all of his views, whatever he happens to be writing on, that that true self, that self that's, that typifies the individual that is in contact with transcendent reality, that that self, that person, is distinguishable from the empirical person that you see wandering around. This is the common idea. Evil in Dostoevsky is ultimately the expansion of the ego over not only other people, but also over that part of the soul that is in contact with eternal life, the forms of Plato. And, you know, what St. Augustine does, of course, is take the forms of Plato as absolute, unchanging, uh, spiritual truth, spiritual in the sense that they are not based on matter and they are not reducible to matter. Uh, in the mind of God. And, and it's certainly acceptable, both logically and metaphysically, for Augustine to do that and became a very uh, important concept in, in the Greek church. But it's not, and this is why Dostoevsky had a problem with Peter the Great, even Pushkin had a problem with Peter the Great, because Peter was viewed as that man who made a principle of transgressing that line that the ego, the empirical ego, that's trapped in this world for the time being, believes itself capable in having the right to transgress either other egos, nature, God, transcendent form. Over and over again, every single solitary one of Dostoevsky's major novels is dealing with this particular idea. 
individuals in this existential situation, in a situation where they are faced with this choice, a choice that they don't know how to deal with, the choice of God on the one hand and the void on the other, and all the implications. Like Ivan is suffering with the implications. If God doesn't exist, all is possible, but ultimately all is meaningless. On the other hand, if God does exist, I got this problem with innocent suffering. What people like Ivan try to do, and a lot of the negative characters in uh, Dostoevsky's novels, what they all try to do is find completion in a world that, at least in its empirical aspect, the aspect of the things that we could see and touch and experience, cannot provide us with completion. The concept of completion can only be provided by that which is in itself complete, that has fully actualized all of its potential, that is unchanging and that is spiritual, that is not based on the self-interest of people or governments or economics or anything else, and that is the transcendent. The central core of Dostoevsky is this idea that everything, uh, uh, everything is seeking completion exactly where it shouldn't be. You can't seek completion and purpose in the world of nature where it is not complete, it is continuously developing, and it's always changing. Completion cannot be found there. That which is beyond and above the ever-changing, this world of cause and effect, ultimately reduced by both Nietzsche and uh, Dostoevsky, Karl Marx for that matter, to the void. The void cannot complete you. The void cannot give you purpose. The transcendent and the transcendent alone. So the negative characters all throughout Dostoevsky, the novels, are based on the idea that they are suffering and that they are in agony and that they are irrational and that they're acting stupid even when they're not really stupid, primarily because they're seeking purpose in objects that themselves do not have purpose or, at the very least, are not complete. So you got the character who thinks that ideology is going to take care of it. You got the character who thinks that science is going to take care of it. You got the character that thinks that uh, uh, nature is going to take care of it. You even have the characters that believe that dogma and religion and philosophy uh, are going to take care of this. None of this can compare, and none of this can provide. Um, none of this can provide solace from this confrontation of the individual soul on the one hand and the void, the ever-changing, uh, always altering flux of the void on the other hand. These things never provide satisfaction. They provide, because, because they promise satisfaction, they in turn give only suffering when people realize that these promises are broken. And what we're going to have, and we're going to deal with this later, and I think next time... Uh, I want to spend the entire period on uh, Prince Mishkin in uh, Dostoevsky's The Idiot because salvation is to be found there in a certain Dostoevskyan literary sense. What does it mean for the person, for a person to be in regular contact with the transcendent, with God and with his action? Not necessarily reduced to dogma and doctrine. Although that stuff is important, that's not the final expression. Ultimately, it's a living and devotional communication with the source and cause of all things, that is to say, something that in, in itself does not change, that uh, is inalterable because it is perfect and whole and true. That ultimately is the end of Dostoevsky's vision, and next time we will deal with uh, um, Dostoevsky some more uh, in Mishkin, in The, the Idiot, and um, and a few other things uh, concerning those those major issues in Russian literature uh, next week. So I want to thank everyone at the Voice of Reason Network. I want to thank, uh, of course, uh, Dietrich and Mishka, who uh, ha are, are running the show right now. Um, of everyone who's my producer, everyone who's helping me with this, Mike Connor, of course. Uh, I appreciate what you do for me, and it is, I know it's a lot of work, and I want to thank you guys, I want to thank my listeners, and I'll talk to you next time. Part 2. Okay, welcome back to another edition of the Orthodox Medievalists, where we deal with the world of the Russian Orthodox tradition, both in Russian history and literature and social ideas. And, as I've said many times, here we center around the idea 
that Russia, the Orthodox faith, which is at her core, is the centerpiece in the battle against the New World Order. That's uh, uh, speaking in terms of social views, in terms of economic views, in terms of building a counter-alliance to the U.S.-Israeli uh, Great Britain uh, alliance currently dominant economically and militarily in much of the world. Russia, in my view, is um, the linchpin of the nationalist and regionalist movement opposed to the New World Order that is vehemently opposed to both nationalism and regionalism uh, with the final view of creating a single global world market based on a very low um, rate of wages because there's simply so many uh, laborers uh, and the final dominance of oligarchy and the oligarchy uh, dominating a cultureless uh, one world labor market and manipulating people through technologies, through uh, m music and movies and the domination of political ideology uh, over actual uh, lived existence. And that's what this is all about. And that's what this movement is all about. Uh, my opinion is, is that the West is largely finished, that there is no fuel there for any serious kind of revolt. Uh, I hope I'm wrong about that, but I, I don't think I am. But salvation will come from the East. Salvation will come from the developing alliance between um, Russia, Iran, and China. And they are building a sort of a non-aligned movement aimed at globalism and aimed at the domination of the American-Israeli nexus. And so providing basic ideas... Uh, theoretical, practical, academic, religious, whatever, in terms of building this alliance, which at the moment does seem to be led by Russia. Uh, Russia is China's uh, major arms supplier as well as supplier of energy. And uh, Russia is at the center of this counter-alliance, of this counter-revolution. And I believe that it is, in general, a very good thing. And so that is the ideological centerpiece of what we do here. And so we try to approach this mentality, uh, this emerging Eurasian idea, uh, from every possible point of view, literary, religious, um, economic, political, aesthetic. And what we've been talking about on this show is Dostoevsky. Dostoevsky is somebody who was fascinated by this concept. Dostoevsky was fascinated by the building of a Russian-led alliance against, against Western aggression. This is uh, this was particularly noteworthy during the Crimean War, where all of the major powers of Western Europe uh, ganged up on Russia in um, their distant port of uh, within uh, the Crimean Peninsula, and Russia, uh, facing a very large coalition of opponents, was eventually forced to sue for peace. And people like Dostoevsky began to consider what Russia really must be if she is attacked with such vehemence by a coalition of Western European powers. That Russia is still not a European society, should not become a European society, and in fact should become a Eurasian society. And that mentality is still very much alive and very popular in, uh, in the Russian world right now. And it's a, an idea that I share and is absolutely central to uh, at least most variants of Russian nationalism that exist out there. Anyway, uh, today we're going to deal uh, briefly with two works of Dostoevsky's. Uh, the earlier work, Notes from the House of, of the Dead, or Notes from the House of Death, uh, and then a little red work, although one of his more famous novels, The Idiot. Notes from the House of the Dead, is um, a, a novel that Dostoevsky writes not too long after coming out of prison. Dostoevsky initially was a, uh, uh, a, a radical, a nihilist of sorts, and um, he was eventually sent to prison for this kind of subversive activity. And it was his time in the Siberian prison that he began to alter 
his basic point of view. His basic point of view after prison we dealt with uh, last week. How this develops is our idea this week. Um, Note from the House of the Dead is about prison life. You see works like this uh, in Solzhenitsyn as well, and we'll deal with him some other time. But the House of the uh, of the Dead or of Death is uh, prison and prison life and the uh, effect of prison life on the personality and on the basic beliefs of the person who was imprisoned. Again, Solzhenitsyn spends a lot of time not so much dealing with the uh, politics of prison life, of the the political side of the gulag and why it exists and what its uh, economic role is, but with the psychological and religious side of prison life. How does your thought process change when you are um, incarcerated? And the first thing that Dostoevsky notices is that almost everybody he meets in his young years in prison has converted to some kind of religious belief. And Dostoevsky's mentality, it really centered around the idea of Pascha or Easter, that for some reason, the prisoners, even those who came from nihilistic or socialist backgrounds, uh, developed a an intense attraction to uh, Easter Sunday as a holiday. That somehow it reflected on them that there is hope for the future, there is hope for their lives, and there is hope for their personalities. And that once these guys get into a rhythm in terms of sleep or eating or... Pre- prison doesn't turn out to be really that bad of an existence. Remember, in Solzhenitsyn and Dostoevsky, prison is a metaphor for the world. You see this in Chekhov as well, in his Ward Number 6, which is a mental institution, but it's run exactly the same as a prison. This is something in Russian literature that comes up again and again and again, using hospitals or prisons as a metaphor for the world. And the point is, is that people outside of prison or outside of the mental institution should not become complacent with their lives because the human mentality can create comfort out of anything. In Solzhenitsyn's uh, uh, work, uh, not the Gulag Archipelago, but uh, in, in works such as um, uh, The Red Wheel and uh, a few other uh, major works dealing with, um, with prison life, uh, the prisoners are not treated particularly badly. In the Gulag Archipelago, they actually are. But um, in you know, I mean, even even in the Cancer Ward, which is a uh, an imitation of Chekhov's Ward Number Six, um, you know, uh, his his prison work generally uh, shows prison life to be tolerable, with the understanding that you know, if if you could make prison life tolerable then you could make life under tyranny on the outside tolerable. This is something uh, very important to, uh, to to Russian literature. Uh, the one thing that shows up, and you see this in Solzhenitsyn, Chekhov as well as Dostoevsky, is the idea of the protection of the personality. We're dealing with gilded cages here. and In a lot of these works, prison life, is shown to be basically tolerable. It doesn't mean it is in prison. Uh, Dostoevsky gives the example that you know the, the prisoners work for a, a pittance wage that all uh, prisoners get. Um, they save this money. They save it very scrupulously. You know, suddenly these people who are completely profligate outside of prison, the minute they are incarcerated, become miserly. They become very rational in the economic sense in terms of saving money, but then all of a sudden, they blow it. They completely blow it, sometimes on things absolutely ridiculous. And Dostoevsky says it shouldn't be any kind of a surprise that what these people are doing is manifesting their personality within a prison environment. The seemingly irrational blowing of money on something like alcohol or, or, you know, um, something that they don't even need or even want that has a very strong um, that has a very strong root, and that root is the manifestation of individual freedom in the context of prison life. The prisoners' house of death, when they're incarcerated, change radically. 
They're profligate outside of prison. They come into prison, and suddenly they're very cooperative. And it's not because of the threat of violence. That is not the issue here. If they are given incentives and they're properly led out on their work detail, they become very intelligent people, regardless of what they are in prison for. They save money. They cooperate with one another on tasks, and sometimes, given this cooperation, go far beyond what's required in the prison life. All of this is very curious to Dostoevsky, and you see it again in, in Solzhenitsyn. Uh, I'm sorry, the work, the work of Solzhenitsyn that I'm thinking of particularly is uh, not the cancer ward, it's the first circle. I used to lecture on the first circle uh, years ago. In, in my opinion, it's the best of Solzhenitsyn's work on the gulag, partially because um, the first circle deals with an elite group of prisoners, scientists, doctors, um, uh, professionals who are in the gulag but are given a life almost identical to the upper middle class uh, of the society at the time. They're in prison, but you would never know it if you went to visit these people. They wear ordinary clothes. They have ordinary jobs. They just have no freedom to leave their position. They have what we would consider a very tolerable, very intelligent life. And yet, of course, that doesn't mean that they're not in, in the gulag. Okay, we'll be right back. Okay, we are talking about Dostoevsky and the problem of, of freedom. Uh, using prison, using the prison system as a metaphor for life in the world. They're not talking about a specific social system. And it's true that Solzhenitsyn is, is taking aim at the Soviet Union, but he doesn't let any other status system uh, off the hook. Prison is a metaphor for the world not for a specific system. What Dostoevsky finds curious is the change that comes over people when they are sentenced. The cooperation, the friendship, the religious belief that comes to exist in prison life that did not exist outside of prison. The central issue with Dostoevsky and Solzhenitsyn dealing with prison life is the problem of the gilded cage. How many people, how many Americans, if they were offered anything that they wanted, a beautiful house, uh, an excellent job, a decent rate of pay, good health, a certain degree of social respect, all of these things, but they had to give up their personal freedom in exchange. My opinion is, is that in this debased uh, American society, that, in fact, the overwhelming majority of the population would take it. They would take it, they would begin viewing human freedom as just arbitrary whim, and they would concern themselves entirely with the material side of life. The point of these prison stories is that prisoners come to be sentenced and come to work together in the prison. They are capable of making their life tolerable. But that has tremendous social implications in that living under a tyranny doesn't necessarily mean that your life is miserable. It just means that your personal freedom is slowly being chipped away. The point of these prison stories is that tyranny doesn't necessarily hurt, but that doesn't mean it isn't harmful. The big issue is that of the gilded cage. Dostoevsky notices also in the prison that he was sentenced that people would, in spite of their very rational behavior, every once in a while, they will show what we might see as irrational manifestations of their freedom. People who, you know, for years are very intelligent and very rational in prison life and do their work and don't get into any much trouble and, in fact, have developed friendships and even substitute families and are living relatively tolerable lives, even though it's in prison, all of a sudden, even just for 24 hours, are going to lose it. They'll figure out a way to buy vodka. They'll figure out a way to get into a fight. They'll be irrational for 24 hours, and then come right back and live their lives again. And Dostoevsky interprets this as that one aspect, and you see this in Solzhenitsyn too, there's one part of the personality that cannot be quantified. It is a pure spirit it is not reducible to any material thing at all, and that is uh, that is a part of you that is free, that is that is the ego that is capable of acting however it wants. 
regardless of external circumstances. Most of your being is quite happy if you've created a tolerable life and you have the material things that you need. Uh, and that's the case with these prisoners as well as middle class people in America. But there is still this irrepressible part of the personality, this free entity that cannot be cataloged, it cannot be put into prison. This is the basis, or should be the basis, of all social life and all social thinking. So even when you have people in or out of prison, and Dostoevsky really for the life of him can't figure out the real substantial differences between the life that these prisoners are leading and the life of the bourgeoisie developing in Russia in the 1860s, 1870s. He can't see the difference. Their lives are equally structured. They both work very, very hard. They both are given a modicum of respect within their respective social environments. The freedom to leave the area uh, doesn't make any difference. I mean, you know, unless something severe happens, no one is going to move from where they are successful in their work. So that's an empty distinction. Dostoevsky really is wondering, I can't see the difference between life in modern society and life in the prison camp. The house of death is exactly what he's talking about here. The satisfaction of the material drives of the human person leading to blindness as to the existence of tyranny. Solzhenitsyn is in the exact same boat here. In fact, Solzhenitsyn's work, the first circle in particular, is taken directly from the mentality of Dostoevsky in the House of the Dead. Life and death is not typified by either a surplus or a dearth of, of material goods. And by material goods, I'm also talking about things like families and things like good reputation, things like having an intelligent cultural life, these sort of things. These are also part of the material world. Both Dostoevsky and Solzhenitsyn talk about this one irrepressible part of the person that is completely whimsical, almost random and arbitrary in how it functions. That's the very core of the person. That is the nature of freedom. That's the one thing that can't be controlled. And yet modern societies, whether they be democratic, whether they be royalist, whether they be Marxist, no matter what they are, all seek to satisfy the material side of humanity, however way they can, in, in any way that they can. And then they identify that with happiness. The problem is, is that Solzhenitsyn, you know, in the first circle, Dostoevsky in, in Notes of the House of, of the Dead, he notices that the life of prisoners and the life of middle class people are pretty much exactly the same. And in fact, the Russian prison system offered quite a bit of freedom to, um, to their inmates. They couldn't go very far, but they were able to have parties and they could have some vodka and they could, you know, particularly if they did their work and in some cases some labor gangs would, would be offered, okay, look, you can have a party here, we'll get you some vodka, we just need to have this project done early. All of a sudden, these guys, we talk, you know, criminals of various kinds, all of a sudden would be incredibly rational. They would work together. They would divide up the labor. They would give each other incentives. They would act, you know, almost in a utopian way for a very small incentive that they're given. I mean, this is very curious. I mean, you know, Dostoevsky says, well, but this is the whole basis of the Western economy, and here we have it rep replicated perfectly in prison of all places. What does that say about the system? Dostoevsky and Solzhenitsyn are talking about capitalism as much as they're talking about socialism, because those two ideologies share uh, as much in common uh, as they do in terms of difference. And at root, they're both materialist ideologies. They're both materialist approaches to the world. Dostoevsky then concludes by saying that the big problem of modern life is that tyranny is not necessarily painful. Under all the tyrannies that we can consider in history, the fact is, is that the bulk of the population was generally left alone. That's a fact. There may have been thousands of people in prison, there may have been executions, but you know the bulk of the population lived their life whether or not they lived under a tyranny or whether or not they lived in a libertarian society. That's something also that both Solzhenitsyn and Dostoevsky noticed. The bulk of the population isn't really affected. So then what's the conclusion? The conclusion is that freedom and personality are one and the same thing. The only real difference between a free life 
and a structured life. The structured life, whether it be middle class existence or prison life, as far as Dostoevsky is concerned, they're pretty much the same thing. Uh, in fact, he can't really see a difference. The only real distinction that he's going to make is the development of the spiritual elements of the personality. The only problem there is that could be done in prison too. Ultimately, you know, the novel really doesn't end. This is going to be the beginning of Dostoevsky's uh, work. But the problem is that you know he now has to struggle with this idea that first of all, all the goods that come, that could come from a state a government, a a well functioning economy, can be replicated in prison and can be replicated very well and very rationally in prison. And this is in the 1850s, 1860s. That's the first thing. But then the second thing is, is that he begins defining the idea of freedom as the development of the spiritual energies, the spiritual engine, the ego, not in a selfish, individualistic way, but defining the ego as the core of freedom. The core of the human being is, in fact, arbitrary. <coughs> It can move to one side or the other. You know, it's not constrained by anything. It can be shut up for a while, but it cannot be completely and totally ignored. <coughs> the development of these spiritual powers in both Solzhenitsyn and in Dostoevsky, the development of these powers can also occur in prison as it can in regular society. So now uh, he's found himself in a dilemma and I think one of the ways that this dilemma is going to be solved is in my personal favorite novel of Dostoevsky, a novel that I strongly urge you to read, a novel called The Idiot. And when we get back, uh, we will deal with some of the major points that come up in that extremely long novel. We cannot uh, summarize the plot or anything like that. That's really unimportant. The importance is attempting to solve the problem. Uh, from Notes from the House of the Dead and how can we build a social understanding that cannot be replicated in the prison system. We'll be right back. Okay, we're going to talk about a novel called The Idiot. It is my favorite Dostoevsky uh, novel. It is not read anymore. It's not read anymore for a whole bunch of reasons. I think I said last week that the problem with Westerners dealing with Russian literature is that people who want to deal with the literary side of Russian life often are not well versed in either the historical or the religious side of Russian life. That's a big problem because I think Russian almost more than any other literature is deeply historical. It's deeply national and religious. Even with people who aren't particularly interested in religion, like Chekhov, for example, religion is saturated in these works. And so to go in and, and, and read something in you know, intensely religious, metaphysical, moral book like The Idiot, without knowing anything about orthodoxy or Russian history or how these things have, you know, how the monarchy has uh, uh, slowly taken over uh, the life of faith and this kind of thing, without knowing these very complicated issues, you don't know what's going on in this book. Dostoevsky is writing this book at the height of his career. He's writing it after the reforms of Alexander II, where the serfs are freed, and Russian life is slowly but surely being remade under the reign of Alexander II, and then his uh, successor, Nicholas I. Um, and he's, he notices a few things. Of course, he's talking about the rise of the bourgeoisie. He's talking about an, an increase of human beings who are no longer working on the land. The freedom of the serfs meant that more and more farmers can, uh, with the permission of their communes, uh, go to the cities and find work. Go to the cities and work in the new factories that are slowly coming into existence, uh, who can become merchants, who can become salesmen and traders and even artisans in the urban life. And even those within the commune, in rural Russia, who are no longer doing agricultural work, but in fact are craftsmen or middlemen or whatever it is. The growth of the kulaki, um, the, the wealthy farmers in the post-Alexander world that begin uh, developing, you know, they have, they have their own liquidity and they become loan sharks in rural Russia. Uh, these are some of the things that are developing in the 1860s and 1870s. And this is what uh, Dostoevsky is uh, talking about. Dostoevsky 
is uh, very anti-bourgeoisie. He opposes the world of middle class materialism, uh, middle class desire for reputation, and and their their belief that ultimately everything has to have cash value or it has no value whatsoever. Classic middle class mentality. Dostoevsky, uh, many nationalists, both in the left wing uh, Narodniks, right wing nationalists uh, as well, are opposed to this trend. Ultimately, the freeing of the serfs in 1861 created as many new problems as the problems that it solved. And in fact, there's a huge debate out there whether or not freeing of the serfs was such a great idea uh, that, in fact, serfs were financially worse off, at least immediately after the emancipation, than they were prior to it. That the, you know, Dostoevsky is reflecting something. He's reflecting the fact that once the serfs are freed, the nobility had been freed from state service for a very long time. Before that, you had a fluid society now that is slowly replacing your more rigid society of classes and hierarchies and state service that had existed prior to 1861 and even earlier than that. The problem that Dostoevsky notices is that in a society that is fluid, where you don't have these tightly defined legal classes, binding people to their particular area of service, as has been the case in, in Russia uh, through most of its history. The dollar, the ruble in this case, becomes the arbiter of everything. Class status and legal status is slowly being chipped away. The only thing that can take its place is the middle class love of money, profit, and reputation. This is the shift that really is is at the bottom of almost all Russian literature of the 1860s and 1870s, coming to grips with a society that that has had its traditional moorings dissolved and is now based on these very fluid relationships, not to mention the fact of the growing importance of wealth and the growing importance of a working class, a, a class that doesn't own much, works in the factory, lives in a bunkhouse, completely different from the life in the countryside where even under serfdom you were guaranteed your land, you were guaranteed your home, you were guaranteed everything under serfdom in Russia uh, with the exception of course of your personal freedom which you did not have but if anything Dostoevsky notices that the life of the factory is infinitely worse morally and physically than life under serfdom and so I mean, that's pretty much how the novel opens. I mean, he assumes that his readers know this. But you open up the page one, and you don't know this. You have no clue of what's going on, why this is so important, why this is at the center of everything that everybody in the 1860s and 1870s is writing about. Russian literature makes no sense whatsoever without understanding this social background. Everything is changing. The old legal categories are gone, and it's gone not because of some civil war, not because of some terrible shock to the system, but because the royal house said it's going to change. The Russian monarchists are very fond of saying that the, U, the United States had to lose uh, a huge number of its sons in civil war and see cities in the south burn and, and see a terrible uh, human rights abuses all over the place in the Civil War. Hundreds of thousands killed. And in Russia, it just took the emperor to sign a piece of paper that said the serfs are now free. But that's significant as well, that all of this, the, the changes in legality don't exist because of some sort of demand from some organized group or some violent revolution, but because the emperor and the Senate have agreed that things need to change. The idiot is a man by the name of Prince Mishkin. He is uh, living abroad. He is not living in Russia during these upheavals. He is a prince, which means that in Russia in the 1860s, 1870s, it's pretty much a meaningless term. All you call yourself prince something, all it means is that somewhere in your family tree, you had a relative that in the Middle Ages was either um, an aristocratic clan, or a part of the aristocratic clan that ran one of the older Russian provinces, you know, Kiev, uh, Ryazan, Novgorod, whatever it was. That's all it means. 1860s Russia, it means absolutely nothing. So Dostoevsky has this man be a prince, coming from the old Russian uh, princely lines prior to the Mongol invasion 
prior to the time of troubles because Dostoevsky is saying that this man is hearkening back to a very different age in Russia, an age prior to royal absolutism on the one hand and in an age prior to the dominance of the bourgeoisie and their obsession with money on the other. Prince Mishkin is the idiot. He comes to Russia, he is, a, he is an epileptic as Dostoevsky was. He comes to Russia with a title and absolutely nothing else. He doesn't have money, he doesn't have property. He is introduced to a social circle that he doesn't comprehend. These people are, men and women are interested in their reputations, in their money, and how people view them, whether or not they're physically desirable. The prince knows nothing of this. Money is at the center. The worship of money, money as this new substratum of social relations, 1860s, 1870s, because so many of the other things that held society together are gone. The common language, I mean, you still have the elites in Russia speaking French. You still have Western ideas, foreign ideas, alien ideas coming in from Europe and elsewhere. You have uh, the translations of all of these Western literatures. You have a slow decline of the church under state control. The rise of revolutionary groups, uh, industrialization, the growth of cities. All of this, Dostoevsky, and I have to say myself as well, views negatively. The prince knows nothing of this. But he exists as the conscience of the society that he is introduced to. Everybody that the prince meets is drowning in darkness. The women are bratty. The women are uh, obsessed with having men like them, using their beauty to control men, to dominate them, to get their way. The men, on the other hand, are obsessed with money and reputation. They're corrupt, sensual beings. The prince alone remains uh, almost their conscience. He is, he is the spirit of old Russia. He is the spirit of freedom. Natalia is the symbol in this novel for Russia. Natalia is beautiful, intelligent, a wonderful person in everything else except the fact that she is absolutely morally debased. There was a time where she was not. There was a time where her beauty was something to be admired rather than used as a weapon against men. She is a symbol for Russia. The idiot and Natalia develop a relationship. The idiot seems to be completely asexual, which is just another manifestation of his innocence. The idiot seeks Natalia not because he wants her, not because he wants to get married, not, not, you know, none of these traditional things. He views himself as the one who is going to save this woman. He can't take the fact that this beauty, this charm, this intelligence is now placed at the service of a corrupt society and therefore corrupts her. You see this in Gogol's short story, Nevsky Prospect. It comes up again and again. And, and, and these, these female figures, um, Liza in, in, uh, in uh, uh, Crime and Punishment, uh, Sonia, yeah, this, these characters come up again and again in Dostoevsky and in Russian literature uh, in general as the, they're, they're tragic figures they have what at a different age would have been great cultural assets beauty in every way but in this society it's, the beauty is now being used for debased ends that is a metaphor for um, the new Russia that has developed in the 1850s and 1860s it's, it shows you what modernity will do uh, to traditional ideas of beauty. Everything from art to how a woman looks, all of these things are debased in a world that revolves around money and comfort. And we talked about money and comfort and what these really are in the house of death. You can have money and comfort in prison. Solzhenitsyn says so in the first circle. You know, all of these things are relative, they're relative to your society, and, and therefore you can build a tolerable life in prison. Dostoevsky is saying that all of these people are absolutely drowning in darkness, and their freedom is being prostituted for the sake of money, for the sake of good reputation, for the sake of power and domination. Power for no other purpose than power. Money for no other purpose than enjoying yourself. Ultimately, these are strictly transitory, almost random things that very quickly wear off. Mishkin is a populist. Mishkin is a mystic. 
He is very abstract in his ideas. He is, he's eccentric. He likes to be himself. He likes to live in solitude and even live in a world of fantasy. The only people that Mishkin, and this is actually one of the most touching parts of this very long novel, the only people that Mishkin can ever really relate to are young children. And he can only relate to these young children because they are purely innocent just like he is. This is a reflection of the fact the upper classes in Russia are removed from the soil. An increasingly large number of people are being taken from the life of farming, the life of old Russia, the stable life of the land, and thrown into the endless flux, the swirl of the world of money. Dostoevsky is holding that a strong sense of old Russia and the medieval world is absolutely necessary for the mentality of Mishkin to return. Prince Mishkin is not an activist. He is not an active fighter. He doesn't accuse anybody. He doesn't walk into a, a, a society party and start talking about you know, the orthodox world and, and morality and everything else. It's his person. It's his very presence that causes the trouble. He is abused and he laughs with his abuser. He's made fun of, and he makes fun of himself in return. He's confronted by the area. You know, the women are kind of, you know, they're they're attracted to him because of his innocence. They believe that they could take advantage of him. They believe that he has no experience in, in the relationship world, the sexual world, and they can manipulate him that way. And how does he respond? He responds with humility and self-abasement. And he is able to be victorious over all these people without actually entering into any kind of a fight. But... Michigan notices that these people, regardless, they, they may even go to church every week, God is not present in anything they do. It is their will, it is their selfishness, their freedom is being swallowed up in this worship of money and reputation and social position. But these things are fleeting. These things change every day. But you don't confront that with a social movement. No social movement can confront it because social movements live in the same world as these people do. Social movements live in the world of power for power's sake, money for money's sake, the desire for a good reputation, manipulating the population. All social movements are like this. Dostoevsky does not believe in building a social movement. He believes in confronting evil with innocence and love. Tolstoy is the exact same way in this regard. Only that can overthrow these people. The idiot ultimately divides the concept of love into two. Dostoevsky holds that love can be, in its lower side, the dark eros, the sensuality, sex for sex's sake, sex for power's sake, sake for, uh, sex for the sake of believing that you're this wonderful, desirable person. And on the other hand, love as agape, love of innocence, love of the spirit. You know, Prince Mishkin has this relationship with, with uh, Nastasia, and the relationship is, is platonic. But it doesn't mean that love isn't there. But the love is fraternal. The love for this beautiful woman is, is, is a love for her beauty, not as something to be possessed, but as something to save and to use for the regeneration of society. She doesn't understand what that even means. She's grown up with this idea that, well, thank God I'm beautiful because I could use it to manipulate all the men I want and I could get, I could get whatever I want. Michigan has no concept of this. He, she, he has no clue of what that mentality even is. And so, as you have two different kinds of love, you have two different kinds of beauty. You have a beauty in sensuality, this is Nastasia's uh, uh, mentality, and Aglaya, uh, another much younger character, uh, beauty in innocence. Beauty doesn't necessarily mean that the person who is admiring the beauty wants to possess and dominate that. That's the lustful, sensual idea. It has nothing to do with love, in the best sense of the word. Lust has to do with appropriation and domination. That's the problem with it. Lust is about momentary pleasures that have no ultimate meaning. But there is the love of innocence, the love that children have towards their parents, the love that a Christian has towards God, innocent, not based on any desire for appropriation, not based on anything but an innocent, childlike love, which Dostoevsky, Tolstoy, so many others hold up as the ultimate expression of the human person. Nastasia ends up loving Prince Mishkin as a sensual object, an object to be dominated. Prince Mishkin loves her as a sister or as a niece. It's not sensual. It's not about appropriation or domination as lustful relations are. It's not about that. 
It's about confronting the evil of society with innocence. He doesn't care about social reputation, so he doesn't care when people make fun of him. But because when people make fun of him, he doesn't care, it means that he actually wins. These people can't control him in the way that they try to control each other. That means he's in charge, and he doesn't even do anything. That's the significance here. This is how Dostoevsky is trying to solve the problem. The problems that come up in books like Notes from the House of the Dead, that the middle class life is just as much at home in prison as it is in the broad world. Almost identically, just, I mean, it's a different context, but identical in terms of content. How is that to be dealt with? Prince Mishkin is the person who, and the mentality that is going to deal with it. That's, this is, this is a, a major part of Dostoevsky's social ideas, and religious and moral ideas, is found in the person of Prince Mishkin. We can only deal with very, very basic ideas here. This is a very long novel. This is a very complex uh, development. I'm giving you a very, very brief uh, you know, kind of theoretical overview of the whole thing. But this is a deeply philosophical approach to the world. Social movements will not change Russia. Social movements will not reform the bourgeoisie. And that's because social movements live in the exact same world that these people in. It's power, it's control, it's appropriation, it's domination, it's gaining the levers of state power to do nothing but satisfying your every whim. That's ultimately what politicians do, even politicians that we like and that we agree with. Ultimately, it's one of the reasons that Dostoevsky is a monarchist, because a monarch isn't a politician by definition. A monarch isn't a part of any social movement, and therefore it does not live in the same world as the politicians do. Prince Mishkin is the principle of innocence, of an earlier time, of a life dedicated to family and the soil. It's a life dedicated to innocence, and he's confronting that with the middle class life in Russia, the life dedicated to domination of the lust for money, the lust for physical appropriation. All of this ultimately is a domination of one person over another, and that's really all it's, it's about. This is how Dostoevsky wants to solve the problem that comes up in his earlier works about the nature of the personality and about the nature of the prison, the prison that exists inside, the prison that exists outside, the prison that exists in middle class life, and the prison that exists whenever your freedom is prostituted for the worship of money and ultimately the domination of other people which money can help you buy. This is what Dostoevsky is all about in this novel. So, anyway, I am out of time. I thank you guys for listening. Uh, I really want you guys to buy a copy of The Idiot and, and read it. Uh, I think, I think it'll, it will change. It's changed a lot of people. And it's uh, one of the most powerful things, if not the most powerful thing, that Dostoevsky ever put together. So I want to thank everybody who's been listening. I want to thank my producers. I want to thank uh, Mike and Steve, of course, and um, everybody who made this show possible. I appreciate all that you've done for me, and I will talk to you next week. Bye-bye. Part 3. Okay, everybody, welcome to another edition of The Orthodox Medievalist. Uh, I want to thank all my listeners. I want to thank the people at Voice of Reason for for helping me and for getting this show off the ground and for providing me this, this opportunity. Uh, today, we are going to talk about Dostoevsky. We're going to talk about two things uh, concerning this man. We're going to talk about, first of all, the novel The Possessed, uh, which, although gets quoted an awful lot, doesn't get read very much. Uh, And then, if we have time, we're going to deal with uh, Dostoevsky and the idea of nationalism. Um, I want you guys to know uh, right up front that people like Dostoevsky and Gogol and Jolzenitsyn these people didn't have hard and fast ideological predispositions. It's impossible to take these guys and to list their ideological points of view in some kind of a logical form. Um, uh, this, this largely derives from really a, a literary uh, understanding of society where um, we realize that the interactions of individuals and families and communities, etc., are complicated. That these things take place in a matrix of all kinds of different ideas, psychological predispositions of people, economic issues, and that these interactions are so complicated that no ideological point of view uh, could ever understand them all. 
uh, to a great extent, modern ideology is really only, or I should say ideology as a way of looking at the world, is a very recent phenomenon. It's only over the last couple of hundred years that you've had these pamphlet-style uh, approaches to politics based on a few slogans that even you know semi-literates can memorize and then go out and sound intelligent uh, spouting off uh, the ideological cliches. That's how American politics works, at least at the surface level, uh, that any particular ideolo ideological point of view that you may hear on CNN or Fox can be memorized in the space of a few minutes. It's an immensely superficial approach to, to politics and morality. So when you have these literary figures who specialize in the intense complexity of human relations, whether it be uh, economic or political or social or moral or psychological or sexual or, or familial or whatever, that these constant cross-cutting patterns are so complicated that uh, they could never really be, be reduced to ideological slogans. So with any of these guys, you're not going to get a ideological approach to the world. That simply does not happen here. Now, to some extent, the novel The Possessed, uh, or The Devils, depending on which translation you, you use, is an attack not merely on nihilism or left-wing ideologies of one kind or another, but it's an attack on ideology itself. Um, and we're going to get to that in a minute, but, but let's start off by defining uh, one of the central concepts here. The possessed is dealing, among many other things, with the concept of nihilism. And it's actually very rare that people who use the term have any clue what they're talking about. But again, it's very typical in, in, in politics. Nihilism is not a positive doctrine. It's a negative doctrine. Nihilism does not mean that the nihilist doesn't believe in anything. The nihilist holds that everything that presently exists because it can't be conformed to his will, has to be destroyed. That's really the basis of the nihilistic content of this, of this novel. Now, it's a bit more complicated than that, but understand that first and foremost. There's a distinction between the nihilist as a person demanding that the, will, that, that the world conform to his will, which really ultimately is what ideological politics is all about. If it doesn't conform to my will... If it doesn't conform to the slogans that I've memorized in school, uh, it, it is evil and therefore has to be destroyed or altered. The nihilist, generally speaking, doesn't deal with positive doctrine. Of course, Marx didn't either. Um, nihilists in Russian history, uh, you see this in, in Turgenev, of, of Fathers and Sons, with the, the nihilist uh, Barazov. About the only thing that Barazov really says positively is that the future world will be based on science. And, of course, back then, what it meant was German materialist science in the middle of the 19th century. So everything that exists now has to be destroyed. You see this to some extent in, in Bakunin. And what will take its place? We will create a void. We'll take what exists, we'll destroy it, we'll create a void of nothingness. All that will exist is the will of these people who have created the void in the first place. Therefore, what will be built on this void that we will create is a, uh, essentially a new idea of knowledge, uh, of, of the scientific technique based on materialist assumptions. That's pretty much as far as Baz uh, Barazov goes in Turgenev's novel. And the nihilists really, in the possessed, don't go any further than that either. Now, the other issue concerning the nihilists in this novel that has to be taken very seriously is the fact that liberal writers of the first half of the 19th century did not mean for the nihilistic movement or the later communist movement to come into existence. This is really Dostoevsky's big issue here, that what starts off in, say, the 1830s, 1840s in Russia as a relatively humane uh, virtuous, idealistic uh, liberalism, uh, and, and it's those things only in respect to the later nihilists. It, it seems very gentlemanly uh, relative to the people who are going to come later on. They, in their naivete, can't see that the forces that they're letting loose 
by any kind of sudden alteration in the institutions of a society, whether it be the monarchy or the church or the commune or whatever. So Dostoevsky is, is holding two things. He's holding that, number one, nihilism is primarily a psychological disposition. And in fact, he'll go further and say all ideology is in fact a psychological disposition, and that's why it should not be taken seriously. And what I mean by taken seriously is it should not be used as a blueprint for building a new society. Uh, but also that liberalism was so naive that they thought that they could alter the thought patterns of society, they could alter how Russians view themselves, and there will be no consequences with the exception of progress and peace and plenty. In other words, that people will not use this newfound freedom to uh, attempt to re-enslave the population based on some ideological design. Uh, and in other words, the liberals eliminated the um, supports and pillars of Russian society uh, with the assumption that people are generally speaking good-natured, and so long as you know oppressive institutions no longer exist, they will begin to cooperate. The problem is, is their assumption that people are good-natured, that people do not necessarily seek power for its own sake. The people who do seek power or are idealists who uh, just can't wait to do right by people. Uh, and, and these are all of the assumptions. These are non-empirical assumptions. They're definitely non-scientific assumptions that they simply impose on society really without argument. And then when these policies are put in place, they wonder why is it that people are behaving the way that they are. So it's the helplessness of the liberals of the 1840s and 50s that Dostoevsky is um, is poking fun at. And that these liberals still maintain the old aristocratic lifestyle, even to the point of owning serfs, and they don't see a problem there. And then they wonder when the young generation takes these ideas to its extreme and develops into the nihilist movement and the various terror cells uh, that functioned um, with actually some money from the, the uh, Rothschilds in Great Britain throughout Russia in the late 19th century. And they can't quite figure out the connection between their own ideology on the one hand and the ideology taken to an extreme with the following generation on the other. And something that, that Dostoevsky can't, you know, he's, he's making fun of these old gentry liberals um, by pointing at their children and saying, you know, you created these guys, you won't admit that to yourselves, and it just shows your ignorance, your naivete, and your, and your desire to amount to something, your desire to be uh, idealistic sounding and intellectual sounding. And you, you talk about these slogans from the French Revolution, having no clue of what the real consequences of these things are. One of the main characters, and by the way, in terms of, of the possessed, there really is no single main figure. Uh, some people say that that is, a, um, that, is, that is a flaw, and it's because they don't understand the book. Uh, there is no central figure, um, because, well, for a bunch of reasons. Number one, because we're dealing with a series of social movements, uh, none of which really have a personal leader. You're not going to find a personal leader until Lenin in the 20th century. Uh, number two, you're talking about not just ideological or philosophical types. You're talking about psychological types. More than anything else, Dostoevsky is talking about psychological roots of all of these movements. And he doesn't care whether it's a right-wing or a left-wing movement or something else. He is absolutely convinced that, and, and I agree with him to a great extent, that ideology is primarily an expression of the psychological state of the individual or the community of people who hold to that point of view. Now, one of the main um, characters is uh, Stavrogin. He is... Um, one of the new generation of uh, nihilists, and Dostoevsky, uh, I mean, this is a very large book, um, Stavrogin uh, is, is pointed at as really the example of somebody when they are separated from their roots to the soil. There's one thing that's very consistent in Dostoevsky's point of view, and that is Russia is an agrarian country, but even more than that, the agrarian life is superior to that of the urban life or the suburban life. That the life of the soil, although it's very hard work, it's honest, 
and it connects you with a community of people, including the land and the crops and the minerals and the labor itself. When you eliminate people from those roots, you do psychological damage to these people. But it's more than that. Dostoevsky is looking at Western Europe. He's looking at Russia slowly beginning to imitate Western Europe, which he thinks is a big mistake. And he sees a cosmic rootlessness. It's not just a matter of a character like Stavrogin or the Annihilist movement in general. It's the concept of a complete lack of rootedness to the soil, to family, to nation. Uh, what you have and instead is ideology. But these ideologies are really expressions of highly problematic uh, and distorted psychological causes. It doesn't take long, you see these characters, the Vrogan in particular, that the forces that have been released by the liberal generation of the 1840s are out of control by the 1860s. That the forces of desire, the forces of, of lust, anger, that are released in these movements cannot be brought under control, well, I guess by the, with the exception of an equally violent and centralized movement. Violence begets violence, and the only way it ever stops is when somebody with supreme authority and supreme control can then impose his will on the society as a whole. We see this with the Leviathan in uh, with Thomas Hobbes in the in the 17th century, actually 16th century, and uh, Lenin in the Soviet Union. One and the same thing. The only way that the violence can be stopped is somebody with a tremendous amount of power and complete ruthlessness is able then to impose his will on everybody else. Stavrogin is accused, and I think Dostoevsky is saying a lot here, Stavrogin is excuse, uh, accused of being a member of secret societies in St. Petersburg that deal with all kinds of perverted sexual acts, including bestiality. Now, a lot of these secret societies did actually exist in St. Petersburg in the 19th century. I don't know about the bestiality part, but the very fact that someone like Rasputin in the beginning of the 20th century can create uh, you know, a, a, an entire uh, sexual community around himself uh, suggests that the morals of that city had largely disappeared in the beginning of the 20th century. Any concept of restraint, particularly among the wealthy. That's something else. Dostoevsky makes a big deal that revolutionary movements are either led by wealthy people or controlled by wealthy people. Revolutions generally don't just happen. Revolutions, to be successful, have to be well organized, well funded. They have to have a regular full time support staff. They have to have a legal team. They have to have a military team. They have to have training camps. They have to have a regular way of getting weapons and uh, a training and, um, uh, you know, the constant flow of income and economic activities. All of this is a very complicated movement. Normally, you can't do this without strong ties to the system itself. Normally, you can't pull this off without a substantial, well-off, well-educated uh, cadre of people. Uh, in nowhere in this book, The Possessed, nowhere really in, in terms of the, of the basic policies of revolutionary movement do you have any real discussion of how the poor are going to be lifted out of poverty, how they're going to be put on a strong moral and economic footing, uh, the characters in The Possessed are concerned with power and power for power's sake. Again, stressing the idea that these movements are basically uh, understood as um, manifesting mass psychology, not a understanding of, of social life. But Stavrogin is accused in a very pointed way of being a part of uh, Petersburg uh, sex cults. He um, seems to suggest that this might be the case by marrying a retarded cripple. He marries a retarded girl, a crippled girl named Maria, uh, and she is, and, and, and people attack him for this. They think, and it's probably the case, that he marries her just to defile her, just so he can have a woman completely under his control and manipulation, a way to keep the object of his lust in front of him and under control at all times. And Dostoevsky makes a point here that vice, and not just sexual vice, but, but the constant obsession with money, these vices are a drug. They're addictive. Once you get into them, it's very hard to get out of them. 
strictly on psychological grounds. You know, when, when you look at the powers that be that control uh, both the left wing and the right wing in American politics, the big foundations, the big universities, these people, always wealthy, elite people who control these things, they're never satisfied. No matter how wealthy they are, they still want more money. They have more money than they can ever spend or probably ever know, and it's never enough. And if they're not talking about money, they're talking about power, the use of this money to control society. The, the corrupt media in America made a big deal last year when Bill Gates and Warren Buffett spent billions of dollars to, uh, and gave it to charity. Well, of course, what they didn't tell you is that they gave these monies to um, uh, left-wing ideological movements. They gave them to the pro-abortion movement. They gave them to a uh, left-wing version of the environmentalist movement. They gave them to homosexual and, and, and immigrant movements. They gave them to NAACP and NOW, uh, the National Council of Churches. They gave them to every left-wing group they could get their hands on. Of course, it's about power. But the desire for money and the desire for power is really one and the same thing. If comfort and ease is what these people wanted, all they would do is take a few million dollars, sell the rest of their holdings, and go retire to Jamaica or the south of France and live there for the rest of their lives. But they don't do that. They remain in the stress-filled uh, struggles in the economic world in America and Europe, suggesting that they really aren't interested in ease and a good life. They're interested in power. They're interested in domination. It's not about money anymore. If it was simply about you know having nice cars and boats and women, they would just take a billion dollars, sell everything else, and move away and never have to work another day in their lives. Any of these rich guys can do that tomorrow with minimal effort, but they never do that. They stay, they continue to work 16 hours a day and continue to suffer in this stress-filled world. That exists today. It existed in 19th century Russia, and Dostoevsky does scratch his head about this. It's about power. It's about control. But these things are desired because they have addictive capacities, especially when uh, you have a view of the world. You have a view of the world that there really isn't anything. It's simply a blind play of forces. There is no spiritual reality in the true sense of the word. There certainly is no God or natural law. So what is there? There's cause and effect. There's power. There's the interplay of uh, material forces and energies. That's it. There is no purpose. There is no final end. Now, that's a mentality that comes up in almost every single one of Dostoevsky's works. How could anyone live and function in that point of view? And, in fact, there is another character, Kirillov, uh, in uh, The Possessed, that has precisely that point of view. He cannot reconcile the fact that I, on the one hand, I'm an atheist, I believe in freedom. There's always a highly intelligent atheist in Dostoevsky's novels. There's always an atheist who is extremely... Dostoevsky's idea is, I'm going to make the atheist characters as intelligent as I possibly can, put in their characters the, the ultimate, up-to-date scientific points of view on things. It's not an intellectual problem. It's a moral problem, it's a psychological problem. A character like Kurilov, Kurilov he can't you know, he believes in atheism and free thought on the one hand, but realizes from, science, from, a, from, a, from a certain scientific point of view that there is no freedom on the other hand. Everything's a matter of simple cause and effect. There is no room for freedom here. Kirillov says, and this happens again, you see this all throughout Dostoevsky's works, Kirillov says, if God is real, then my will doesn't mean anything. Everything is under God and I have to serve him full time. That would be the consistent um, uh, conclusion from saying that God exists. If God exists, then my will doesn't mean much. But if God does not exist, then my will means everything. In fact, if God exists, my will means nothing. The only will that matters is the divine will itself, God's. On the other hand, uh, if God does not exist, then it doesn't mean there's not divinity. There is divinity. But that divinity is now my own will. My will becomes divine. But I can't really take that seriously, Kirillov says, because I look around me and I see life as absolutely absurd. I look around me and I notice that there is no freedom. There can't be any freedom. If I take the human mind as a series of nerve endings and energies and electricity firing off in, in a certain pattern, I can't call that freedom. 
And it's no different in, in the human mind than it is in a tree, than it is in human society, than it is in economics, than it is in the grass. It's all one and the same thing, a random firing of electricity and energy and force. So how can I talk about freedom? There is one way. There is one way I can talk about freedom. There is one way I can negate this mindless, literally mindless cause and effect, and that is suicide. Kirillov is not the only suicide in Dostoevsky's novels. Um, Ippolit is in The Idiot. Uh, again, on a very similar point of view, it seems that if I hold the point of view of your classic 19th century materialist atheist, the only way that I can make my freedom real is by killing myself. That is the one act, the one proof of the divinity of my will. If if God creates the world, I can negate the world. And at the very least, even if I hold that God exists, I am his equal in that respect. Because in killing myself, I eliminate God's creation, or at the very least, I eliminate my awareness of God's creation. But this is a kind of insanity that people like Kirillov end up falling into. In other words, suicide ends up being a protest of this will, this this will that seeks freedom, but from a scientific point of view, from an ontological point of view, cannot find it in the way that science understands the world as a series of random forces cause and effect of immense complexity. So, we'll pick up there when we come back. Okay, uh, we are talking about Dostoevsky's The Possessed. It's a novel that is immensely complex, dealing with the concept of ideology, dealing with the concept of the destructive elements of ideology as an expression of human psychology. We ended up by talking about vice as a drug, that immoral acts become addictive, and that once you get into that lifestyle, it's nearly impossible to draw out of it. Now, uh, the way that Dostoevsky creates characters, and Stavrogin in particular, um, he's, he's, car- he's making a couple of points. He's talking about rootlessness. He's talking about an ideological point of view that justifies an already distorted personality. So, let's make this clear. It's not like anybody in the world ever sat down with their books at the library and said, okay, I want to decide what ideology I'm going to be. I'm going to decide what religion I'm going to be, what particular scientific point of view I'm going to have. And so I'm going to read as much as I possibly can on this topic. And I'm going to make a pro-con list for each particular ideological or religious view that I could find. And then when I'm done with that, I'll tally up all my pro-con lists and then I'll decide what I'm going to be solely based on that. Has that ever happened? Of course it's never happened. Well, if something like that has never happened, then how is it that people develop the particular points of view that they have? Dostoevsky says, well, it has to have something to do with their internal psychological makeup. In other words, ideology comes after the person has already manifested that makeup in their day-to-day life. So somebody who is very morally restrained might look very seriously at conservatism, not because they believe it's a priori true, but because it seems to mesh with how they already function. So the way that Dostoevsky views the nihilists, Stavrogin in particular, is that they've already uh, immersed themselves in a life of vice. And therefore the best thing to do is never to change themselves. I mean, yeah, they're addicted already. This is how they live and this is my habit. No, they're not going to change themselves. They're going to then change how the world functions. And they're going to then either adopt or create an ideology that justifies themselves, justifies their actions, and justifies what they want to impose on the world. But all ideologies, all social theories take of this one way or another. Revolution is a shelter for bruised egos. When you read about Stavrogin in The Possessed, this is something that you get. Dostoevsky makes a big point that left-wing ideology, not just in Russia, but in Central Europe, the revolutions of 1848, 1860, 1861, all of these revolutions have been controlled and led by very well-off elite people. 
very well financed from, from sources around the world. These are not poor people. These are not put on people. Usually, they're members of the noble class who have been kicked out of political power. Now, this is the pattern. Uh, they could be uh, middle class or upper middle class elites, uh, intellectuals who don't believe that the system reflects uh, the power that they have. It's a simple matter of self-interest, but at the very least, the last thing these people really care about are the slogans that they put out in public. It's about power. They may talk about democracy and equality, but that's a weapon to use against the old system. They don't care. They would reject a fully democratic election if their friends did not win. That's the case with all ideologies. They impose their particular vices on the entire population. Their vices have gotten so severe that they can't see straight. They can't look at a person and see another person. They see a rep replica of themselves. I'm this way, and therefore society is this way, and it's always been this way. These are people who believe themselves to be geniuses, who believe themselves to have unlocked the key to history, as Karl Marx said, as Mikhail Bakunin said. And therefore, how can anyone possibly oppose me here? It's about power. What the possessed is, is Russia as a whole. What the demons are, are these relatively wealthy individuals who have liberated themselves from all moral restraint or even worse, have invented their own set of morality and then talk about how virtuous they are because they maintain their own moral system. Their own moral system, which of course is purely self-interested. Dostoevsky says that the cause of this, the possession of Russia and these demons running around possessing her, is that a true sense of brotherhood has disappeared. Now, Brotherhood, in this case, is a relatively technical term. In Russia, uh, in Russian, it is subornos. In Ukrainian, it's subornos pravanya. These words are highly technical phrases that developed in the 19th century within a specifically Russian context. Let me make the distinction here. The Slavophiles, Dostoevsky, the Russian nationalist movement in the middle of the 19th century made a crucial distinction between how Russians and Easterners view brotherhood and how Westerners view brotherhood. And of course, they're specifically referring to the French Revolution that um, uh, liberty, equality, and fraternity, brotherhood is right there in their slogan. So they're going to take this very seriously. Distinction between the subordinates in Russia and the idea of fraternity in the French Revolution is this. That the nature of the bonds that create community and brotherhood. The nature of these bonds are internal. These are unspoken cultural ties going back generations that relate one person deeply and intimately to another person. They are brothers because they come from the same great family, in this case Russian Orthodox Christendom. It's a deep faith and a faith here, that's a relationship. A faith does not refer to believing something that you can't see. Faith always refers to a specific relationship that somebody has with God, and as a result of that, with the soil, with the farmland, with the community. For Dostoevsky, these really all were a descending menu. It was all essentially one and the same concept, just seen from very different points of view. The subordinates means that the bonds among people are internally understood, not necessarily expressed in institutional form. It can take institutional form, but doesn't necessarily have to be expressed that way. Now, the West is exactly the opposite. Western liberal ideologies deriving from the French Revolution viewed brotherhood as something that is imposed that is primarily institutional. It comes from the creation of a party, of a class. It derives from the state. It derives from a certain uh, local government arrangement that then administers the affairs of the population. That's the exact opposite of the Russian concept of subordinates. And this is, this is how you know Russian nationalists could never comprehend the mentality of Marxism 
the mentality even of Western forms of nationalism because they're based on two very different points of view. There can be no nationalism in the true ethical sense of the word unless people view themselves as making up one extended family and having those internalized bonds. In the West, these ideas are imposed by the state. They're imposed by economic forms, even educational and scientific forms. But Dostoevsky looks at these Western ideologies and he sees a very well-written logical shell, very interesting, worth reading. But in terms of day-to-day -day life, it's just a shell. People still remain isolated from one another, regardless of the ideological slogans that they happen to ch uh, chant in their demonstrations. Here's another concept that needs to be taken very seriously in the possess, the idea of vice. The idea of vice is justified uh, by ideology, but there's one more step. Vice turns men into machines. Dostoevsky is relatively opposed to the concept of industrialization because so many of the Russian emigres in the 19th century, uh, you know, the Harrison and Bakunin, these people, they, they go off, they live in Germany or England or France, and they come back to Russia usually very disillusioned in how uh, Europeans live. And one of the reasons that they become very disillusioned is they really see economically that machines don't work for men. Men work for the machines. And they see that the economic system of industrial capitalism has turned men into machines. But there's, there's something more. Somebody who is addicted to vice is easy to control. The characters, the nihilist characters in The Possessed talk about what they're going to do when they gain power. One of the things that they're going to do is make certain that traditional morality goes out the window. Traditional virtue goes out the window. It's very difficult to control somebody who maintains the old orthodox way of life. It's easy to control somebody when they are addicted to their own lusts and desires. And it doesn't take a genius to figure out how. If you're in a position to satisfy that desire for a certain person, then you control that certain person. If someone's addicted to drugs and you're the only game in town in terms of getting those drugs, you can make that person do whatever you want for you. It's very different in the concept of subornos, in the concept of internal bonds of both religious uh, and ethnic background. Machines are easy to control. When you reduce the human mind to a series of desires that demand to be fulfilled, all you've done is turn a man into a machine. The machine demands fuel, and if all the parts are in working order, it will do what it's supposed to do, and it will be very predictable and very scientific. That's exactly what the modern ideologues want to do to the population. And Dostoevsky really makes no distinction between the various ideologies that are developing in 19th century Russia because he does have a Russian nationalist, Shatov, um, falling into the same trap as these other guys. Um, uh, Shatov is one of these guys who is a, he's a firm Russian Orthodox nationalist that as the book goes on, turns out to be an atheist. This is not an uncommon theme in Dostoevsky's work. The idea that you can have a full religious system, a full theology, beautifully put together, very intelligent, uh, very philosophical, a strong cultural background, a strong uh, concept of a Christian civilization, have this all function, have this all um, uh, operate uh, as, as well as it can be, and have no God present whatsoever. That what really matters here is the system, not the fact that it derives from a divine source. So Dostoevsky is not, you know, just talking about nihilists here. You know, at the time in Russia, the nihilists were the most violent. I mean, they were they were terrorists. They they you know, uh, they shot government officials. They shot sympathizers to the government. They they you know planted bombs. They eventually will kill uh, Alexander the Second. Uh, you know, I mean, so obviously they are the people who are getting all of the attention. But he's not going to discriminate here. You know, so you have a situation in the possessed where you have all of these ideologues. Not one of them is stupid. Not one of them is uneducated. All of these people are educated, basically noble-based um, writers and theorists and activists. They are all very intelligent, and they're intelligent in the sense that they all have a very well-thought-out ideological system. 
But having a very well thought out ideological and philosophical system has absolutely nothing to do with how you behave. So you have somebody like uh, one of the main characters, the, the, the classic liberal of the 1840s, um, <coughs> really as close as you can get uh, to really a hero, and he's not, he's not a hero, but he's as close as you can get, uh, Verkovensky. Uh, he is an older man, a liberal of the 1840s, very naive, uh, a pure idealist, classic um, liberal aristocrat. You know, he maintains the old aristocratic way of life, but just with a liberal outer coating. So, in and of himself, basically harmless. It's just that he then creates progeny that take the liberalism and throw out the aristocratic virtue. And then, you have an animal. The problem with Rikolovensky is that he, you know, his personal behavior, including the ownership of serfs, occurs and exists, you know, basically immoral behavior within the confines of a civilized uh, liberal way of thinking relative to 1840s in, in, in Russia. So ideological systems don't have any connection with how people behave. So what are they? Again, we go back to the concept that these things ultimately are the creations of human psychology. So uh, ultimately, you have a situation with the nobility, really extremely declining in power and money and influence throughout the 19th century. The nobility is kind of upset about their, their lives, are living off the common population, not really being taxed, not really having to have a job. Um, and so you know, they adopt liberalism as a way of dealing with this guilt. Dostoevsky makes this very clear uh, in, in The Possessed. So it's not a function of whether or not liberalism is true. It's a function that liberalism makes me feel better because I come from a noble background that at least in, in some cases during its existence has exploited the common population and not given anything back in return. So the concept is ideology is the result of psychological stress and psychological trauma. Liberalism cannot control the results of its agitation. And Dostoevsky really makes it very clear that Verkovensky is not a bad man. He may be misguided, he may be silly, he may be idle, and he, well, he definitely is idle. Uh, most of the nobility was at the time. Um, the problem with Verkovensky is that he's a hybrid. The hybrid can't continue to function. Um, he, he maintains the old aristocratic virtue with a liberal ideology. It's not a surprise that less than a generation later, younger people will take the liberalism and throw the uh, aristocracy out the window. All of these characters, uh, Kurilov, Stavrog, and Vilkovensi, Shatov, they want power for the sake of power. They want power because the ideology does something to them positively. That the ideology makes them feel intelligent. It makes them feel powerful. It, may, it gives them the mantle of a prophet. It, it uh, makes them sound well-informed. It covers over their guilt. It justifies their evil behavior. That's the function of these movements. It's never been a function of, rather, of, of whether or not these ideas are true <coughs> or whether or not these ideas will work or whether or not these ideas are good are evil. They function and they gain popularity because they help the psychological state of the people who adopt them. The way that Dostoevsky views this kind of progress, historical progress, is that a society cannot move forward. However you define that, whether it be in terms of morality or religion or mechanization or science, however you define progress, society cannot move in that direction without having the full consent and comprehension of the common population. This is Dostoevsky's problem with Peter the Great. Um, you know, the cult of Peter the Great existed largely with official circles around the monarchy in Russia. Because even Russian nationalists and conservatives, generally speaking, had a big problem with Peter. Solzhenitsyn had a problem with Peter. Dostoevsky had a problem with him. I think any intelligent Russian nationalist will have a problem with Peter the Great based on the idea that he forced at least elite Russia into a European mold. And he executed and exiled a whole lot of people in the process of forcing 
a European, a Western European idea, both in, in Peter's case, a Dutch and a Swedish idea, onto the Russian population. He forced Russia into a foreign mold without the consent of the average population. This is the problem. There can be no historical motion without the consent and day-to-day -day functioning of the common population. They have to be on board, otherwise you simply have the reign of force and violence. That's what Peter did, and ultimately that's what Lenin is going to do. But Dostoevsky predicted the coming of the Len Leninist ideology that used the rhetoric of assisting the poor uh, and assisting the farmers uh, really with the only end of exploiting them sending them to the camps and forcing them to work for a regime that is just as, as economically stratified as any that had come before it. Ultimately, Marxism was a massive wealth transfer. All the wealth of Russia went to the Communist Party. No different than in 1990, 1995, all the remaining wealth of Russia then went to the Jewish oligarchs and mafia figures in Russia. It's one and the same thing. Dostoevsky predicts this idea that ultimately when a ideological group takes power one way or another they're simply going to transfer the nation's wealth to themselves in the name of some ideological point of view. These revolution, revolutionaries are the vainest and most arrogant of people because ultimately it's about them. It's about their desires. It's about their psychological state. Dostoevsky was a national socialist of sorts in that he did believe in nationalism. He also believed in socialism. The socialism that he believed in was based on the old Russian idea of subordinates. The idea of a highly moral, ascetic, uh, agrarian community based around uh, family love, the church, the limitation of wants and the building of virtue. Uh, to the exclusion of this constant search for money and power. Uh, so he believed that, that these two ideas, nationalism and socialism, could work together. And he did develop a, a sense of that kind of interrelation. Uh, but his idea of socialism was a strictly humanitarian and moral idea based on the agrarian way of life and on the, the national idea of Orthodox Christendom. It was a real sense of, of mutual love and love in the sense of the family. The family, the community, and the nation, and the church, all of these are extensions of the family uh, relationship. So, uh, that is a very brief summary of a few ideas in Dostoevsky's The Possessed. We are not able to get to Dostoevsky and nationalism. We will possibly do that next time. Uh, we'll see what else we have on the agenda for next week. So I want to thank uh, Mike and Steve for helping me here, Dietrich, of course, and uh, I want to thank my listeners for uh, bearing with me through a lot of this stuff. I know it, it, it can be difficult for people who are uh, new to this subject, but maybe it will uh, bring you to, to read some of these things uh, and to come to my website, of course, rushjournal.com, uh, where, where a lot of these things are spelled out in, in different terms, uh, different literary figures and political figures as well. So uh, goodbye, God bless, and I'll see you next week.